About 500 years ago, a man named Niccolo Machiavelli wrote a book. 1532, the final copy of that book hit the streets and it was titled The Prince. In that book by Niccolo Machiavelli called The Prince, he gave his advice to young men. And in that book, he gave some ideas that though you may have never heard of Niccolo Machiavelli or his book, those ideas have permeated your culture. In that book, Niccolo Machiavelli advised young men that if you're invited to go to a feast, whatever you do, don't play in those games. If they break out a big yard game, don't get in that game. Here's why, he said, because your team might lose. And then you could be known as someone who was on the losing team. And that would not be good for you politically. Furthermore, if you join that game, not only might you be on the losing team, but it could come about that you actually have a chance to make a difference in the game. And you possibly could fail to make a difference in that game when it counted on you. And then you would be known not only as someone on a losing team, but you could possibly be the one known as the one who lost the game. So don't get involved. Don't become a part of that game. Niccolo Machiavelli said what you should do rather than be involved in the game is stand on the sideline and strike a pose. Strike a pose. He said, the pose of a person who, if he ever actually decided to get in the game, he would be good at it, theoretically. And so his bottom line message was, it's the appearance of things that's more important than the reality it's what is supposed that flies higher than what is true. Stay out of the games. Be a poser instead. And so we come to the culture in America today and what do we find? So many people becoming less and less involved. So much insecurity, listen, in your generation. Now, I don't blame you for this. That's not your fault. You didn't file an application of when you'd like to be born. But nonetheless, it's true that you now are a part of the fabric of a generation that is more shallow than what we've known before in America. You're a part of the Facebook generation. Facebook. It's all about appearance, or at least it can be, and in most cases seems to be. A generation where you take 400 selfies, and you choose the best places, and try and get in the right light, try and get the right thing behind you, all that would elevate the appearance that you're trying to create, and you thumb through 400, or maybe in your case, 4,000 <laughs> photos of yourself, and you only need one. And so 399 pictures get eliminated, all to find that one picture that strikes just the idea that you're trying to create among those 4,000 Facebook friends you have. Well, first, let me tell you, you don't have 4,000 friends. You have 4,000 people who signed up to be on your list. But if you call them at 3.30 tonight and said, I need you at my place now, how many of your 4,000 friends would show up for you at 3.35? A lot of shallowness. And you find that one magic picture and you go, oh, yes. That's the 
the one. That's the, when they see that picture, they're going to be blown away at how good I am. Woo, baby, that is just the right light, just the right, it's my best side. In fact, it doesn't even actually look like me. <laughs> but that's the one. And we post that picture on the page. I was in our camp at Grace Farm. And on this morning, there was a particular girl's cabin. They had cleanup after breakfast. And I talked to those girls. I love doing that. And I said, hey, girls, I noticed that trash can over there is already full. And since you have cleanup, you ought to dump that now because in a little while, it's going to be more full to the point of flowing over and then you have a bigger mess. You should fix it now, right? No one moved. They were stuck, frozen. Remember, if we move, we could make a mistake. If we actually do something, we could cause a spill. They stood there as though I, I just hadn't talked to them. So I talked to them some more. Hey girls, look, that can is already full. You wait till those boys get food in front of them and actually begin to come to life. They're going to put more plates, more cups. They're going to spill stuff. Food is going to be flowing out of that can in a few minutes and then you'll have a bigger mess. You ought to do that now. No one moved. Stuck. What would they think of me if I go and move? What might happen if the can spills? Everyone is in line. They, they would see me. I would be a count. No one moved. So I backed up and charged again. Girls, what you could do is use the charm that God gives young ladies and go find a boy. <laughs> Turn it on. And convince a boy that it would be a good thing for him to take that can and get it to the dumpster. One girl came forward, two big steps. She was pushed from behind. <laughs> All right, at least we have momentum. Maybe it's force, but we have action. And so I thought in my mind, maybe that did it. Maybe my third call has convinced her, at least one, that she needs to go and find a boy and turn on the charm and get that boy to take care of business for her. You go, girl. But she did not go toward boys. She went straight to the can, wrapped her arms around it. She hugged that big husky can and humped it up onto her hip bone and then peg leg walked 40 yards to the dumpster and somehow got that can in the dumpster and made her way back. And on her way, she walked by three boys. Didn't give her the time of day. Inactivity. We're stuck. We're frozen. We're afraid. Freddie lacks self-confidence. If we move, we might mess up. If I join the action, I could be blamed for the outcome. And so we sit in the back of the dugout, hoping that our name is never called. Mark and chapter 1. Would you join me there? It's apparently a fine day. It's at least a fine enough day that fishermen are fishing and people are on the beach. And Jesus himself has come to the beach at the Sea of Galilee on this day, Mark in chapter 1, except this day, though it might not be seen in the weather, is going to be a very different day. It's a standout day. As Coach Eric Russell at the University of Georgia used to famously say, it's a beautiful day in which to excel. Because on this day, Jesus is going to say some words, some short words to four young men and it's going to change the outcome not only of their lives but of human history. Mark in chapter 1, Jesus is at the Sea of Galilee. And verse number 16, Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew. Simon is going to become the one we know as Peter and Andrew is his brother. We know less about Andrew, but I'll tell you one thing. Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. 
Is that good? Is that good? Now you find this first occurrence in John chapter 1. John chapter 1. When Andrew was one of John the Baptist's learners, followers, disciples. But on that day, John had convinced him that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Andrew has now followed Jesus, spent the whole day with him, and rushes to his brother Peter. Is that good? Is that good? Rushes to Peter and says, found him, got to be the one. And the Bible says, John chapter 1, that he brought Peter to Jesus. So here's the older brother syndrome, right? Are you one of those kids? You show up for a class and all they talk about, your older brother, your older sister, how smart they were, how good they were. On and on it goes. And you're like, uh, I have a name too. <laughs> Peter gets talked about a lot. He goes down in history. He's famous. He was crucified upside down, different than the others. Poor Andrew, we don't hear a whole lot about, but we know that. Because without Andrew bringing Peter to Jesus, where would all of those who benefited from Peter's sermons have been? So there they are on the boat now. Jesus approaches them. They're casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. So we have a call. Here's a call. This is not a call to salvation. This is a call to serve. It's a call to go, move, do, and act. It's a call to these boys who already know Jesus. They already met Jesus. They are convinced of Jesus's Messiahship, but now the call to actually do something about their faith has come to them on an otherwise apparently completely normal day when they're going about their normal activities. They're throwing the net. Come ye after me. Four words with a guarantee at the end. Boys, if you do this, I'll take over and I'll do the rest. I'll guarantee the outcome. You leave the nets, come off that boat. We have places to go, people to see, and much to learn. But I will bring it to pass that when you come after me, I will make you to be fishers of men. Is that good? Is that good? These are fishermen. These are no professional theologians. These boys had never heard of Frontier School of the Bible. They didn't know what a section could possibly be. They get called off the boat and they immediately go. No hesitation. They go. Straightway, they forsook their nets and followed him. I wonder what happened to the nets. I can't help it. I like stewardship. That is a valuable net. Someone could make a living with that. Did some other boys find it? And say, whoa, look what washed up on the beach. We could go into business. Some dumb dumb left their net behind. Or did it get washed away to sea? Did it rot right there? People were afraid. The last boys who touched that net, they're religious fanatics now. We don't know because it's not really about the net, is it? It's about the boys who used to throw it. Now they don't anymore because now they've made footprints down the beach with Jesus. One set of footprints approach that boat. Three sets of footprints walk away from it. And when he had gone a little further, thence, 19, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. They got the same call. They got the same guarantee. They made the same footprints. Down the beach they go now. Jesus with four others who will be trained to become fishers of men who will turn the world on its ear with the preaching of the gospel. Is that good? Is that good? Is that ever good? Jesus works with fishermen. Those boys didn't have the degrees. They sure had the temperature, didn't they? Never before in America, 
in my opinion, have we had so many Bible studies. Never before have we had so many books and so many people pouring into bookstores, pouring on to Amazon.com, finding books, gathering books, reading books, making book studies and Bible studies. Never before has so much knowledge about God flowed in America. But are those Bible studies making people to be fishers of men? Or are we just having Bible studies? Because the bottom line of that call is carrying the gospel to people who don't know it yet and even fishermen get to do that. I dare say that Peter and Andrew and James and John had likely never heard of a spiritual gift. What they were concerned about, rather, was spiritual obedience. Which would be better to have? Someone who is spiritually gifted on your team, or someone who is obedient? Give me a team of obedient people. If I'm a coach, give me players who will obey what I said. Don't give me someone who is mega talented who doesn't do what I call in the huddle. The emphasis here is not on who is super talented. It's not on the super intellectual. Who's going to get a job done? Who's going to go, move, do, and act? Who's going to be stuck, frozen, unable to go, suffering from lack of confidence? Who could confidently say, this is the best move I could possibly make. I'm going to make footprints with Jesus Christ. He'll back me. He'll supply me. He'll train me. I can stand in His strength, His power, His grace, and do a job for Him. It won't be about me. It won't be about my talent. It won't be about my soaring intellect. It'll be about my faith. When I played college baseball, there were times that we would go up on a team and our coach would gather us into a huddle right outside the third base coach's box. He would, in effect, put his arms around our team and he would say words like these. He would say, okay, so we're up on the scoreboard. They're going to try and stay in it as long as they can. Their hope is to make a comeback on us, but it's not going to happen. Here's why. He said, we will not be complacent. We will not be satisfied that we've gone ahead of that team. What we're about to do is we're going to put our heel on the back of their necks. We have them underwater now. They are underwater. But with our heel on the back of their necks, we're going to shove. He would say, we're going to shove their head down to the bottom of the pond, into the pond sand, and bury them now. One day when coach said that, I ran through the backstop, left a hole. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but boy, did I ever feel like going and doing something for that. It would get me so fired up. That seems to be the attitude that these boys took on. The odds didn't matter in time. I know you read the story sometimes and you're going, what on earth was Jesus thinking? He's going to hitch his wagon to these guys? Boy, they came out like champions, though, because he did the job. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, the Bible says that they, they saw, they saw the boys and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant fresh, I mean, men. <laughs> unlearned and ignorant men. And they marvel. It says they marvel. All, all those people who should have known a lot more than those boys, just common fishermen throwing nets, they marveled at those boys. And they took notice. Listen. They took notice that they had been with Jesus. On day one, I came... 
And we assured ourselves of the gospel message of the Bible, the gospel of the grace of God. We did that by looking at the very messages of Jesus and those he trained to give the gospel. The following three days I spent in building you up by the word of God and its promises for those who have believed. You've been built up and built up and built up. I have spoken very little, if any, about issues, issues. Now, there's nothing wrong with talking about issues. It's only that there are so many of them. But I would rather spend this time with you, training you what the gospel is, day one, day two, three, and four, training you who you are in Christ and showing you the possession that you now own in Christ to build you up, build and build and build and show you, you do not need to be a wallflower because you have this equipment given by God, His ideas, backed by His Word. These are the kinds of things that cause people to get out of their seat, to come off their boat, to go, move, do, and act because we know we may not be confident in ourselves, but we have every reason to be confident in the God who is preparing even fishermen to do great things for Him. And so today comes your call. And so you have a choice. You have life in front of you, energy, years, time, intellect, training, so much going for you. But your future is headed towards a life. And you'll have to decide how it will be invested. You can either be cool to live the life of someone who's cool, who has the right picture, the right words, the right kind of shirt. Or you'll choose to live the life of the called. But let me tell you something. If being cool means that I can't get in the game, I don't want to be cool. I don't ever want to be cool anymore. If that means I don't get to play, I don't get to join where the action is. I don't have opportunities to be a team member. I don't want that. I don't want that. If being cool means striking a pose, but being stuck, afraid to do anything good, afraid to do anything for God, afraid to have a conversation that's spiritual, afraid to share the gospel of everlasting life that they'll go to hell without believing in, if it means that I can't participate because I'm so afraid that I might mess up or it might not be politically good for me, I don't want that. I don't want to be stuck. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be insecure because that's not cool. Not with those promises. And so today the call comes to you. You can leave Mark chapter 1. Would you meet me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5? 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. Here's some great verses. I hope you mark it in your Bible. Begin it in verse number 19. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 19. To wit... Or to know these things, to have this wisdom, he says, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We have that word. We have the word that brings man and God together. The word that reconciles God and man. We own it. We possess it. We were saved by that word that was delivered to us by an obedient person. Who decided that being stuck wasn't right. And they went and they moved and they spoke. And we know the Lord because of it. Everyone in the world, every single person is either a missionary or a mission field. If you know the Lord, you own the word of reconciliation. Do you want to play or pose? 
If we know enough to be saved ourselves, we know enough to tell someone else how they could be saved too. But the numbers say that out of all the people who say, Jesus is my Savior, 80% of them are doing nothing to help someone else know that Jesus is their Savior. Eight out of ten. Now I know the truth. I think a lot of that 8 out of 10 has never been trained, never been built. And they're stuck because of it. But you, powerhouse of teaching that you've received. It's up to you. It's going to come down in a large measure to what you desire your life. These boys said, what I've known before, this net, this boat, those ways, fish, mm -mm, no longer. I just got an offer. And that's what I'll do. And they became fishers of men. Verse number 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. So the reconciled are the ambassadors. You are, and if you are in Christ, if you have trusted in Him, if you are saved, you are an ambassador. Wait a minute, Freddie, you can't call me that. Because I really have been on the sideline. I haven't been involved. I've never led anyone to the Lord. In fact, I've never tried. Freddie, No. I'm not an am Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Maybe you're a silent ambassador. Maybe you're a scared ambassador. Maybe you're a disobedient ambassador. But make no mistake. We are His ambassadors. To have the gospel is to share the gospel. That was Paul's attitude. He said we were entrusted with the gospel. Therefore we speak. To know this set of information. Is to share it with someone else. That was his attitude. That was the attitude of the fisherman too. To know it is to tell it. We're his ambassadors. Good to see you Mr. Ambassador. I'm glad to be in the same building with you. That's good. Mr. Ambassador. Good to see you Mr. Ambassador. Hello. Nice bow tie. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Ambassador. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Good. Miss Ambassador, good to see you today. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Ambassador. Mrs. Mrs. Ambassador. Mrs. Ambassador. Mr. Ambassador. I'm an ambassador. I may not have the granite nameplate. May not even have an oak desk with mahogany walls, but maybe I'm a fisherman. Who knows the truth of the gospel. And God could use people like me. None of us can do everything. But all of us can do something. You could say amen right there. And implicate yourself as someone. With an expectation. That you could be used for everlasting life. For someone who needs to know. Look over across the page. 2 Corinthians 4. In verse number 3. He says. But if our gospel be hid. It is hid to them that are lost. Look, the lost are going to hell forever. But not only that, they're living an awful life today. Today. They're separated from the God who created their heart. They have no idea about how good it is to know the God who designed them a brain to think ideas. They've never made a spiritual decision in their lives. <laughs> Do we want to hurt them even more? We're not mad at people because they're lost. We got to get this straight. You shouldn't be mad at them because they don't know Jesus Christ. 
They're pitiful. Even the arrogant among them, they are pitiful in their self-reliance and arrogance. I really don't want to make life hard for them. I don't want them to stay lost. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. We have the flashlight. We have the gospel flashlight. And all these people who are having to choose their life made. They're having to figure out how to make a living. How to earn their money. How to stay out of prison. How to make a Michigan left turn. They're trying to figure out life. And it's so complicated to them. And they have no idea of how to be spiritual. All those people who will one day die and go to hell for lack of faith alone. In Christ alone. And we have the gospel flashlight to shine for them. And we are stuck in our seats. Afraid to move. I don't think anyone wants that. I don't think you want to settle for that. But make no mistake, the culture will take you down the waves. And one day you will look back over your lifetime and you will see that you were stuck. Unless you get off that boat, put that net down. And become that kind of true blue disciple of Jesus Christ who becomes the fisher of men. Verse 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Skip, skip, verse number 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. See, as long as we look at ourselves, as long as we know about our own disappointments, our own weakness, our own lack, as long as we make it about us, what we can do, we miss the point. As long as we think, I need to be spiritual Superman in order to... No. No. Superman doesn't exist in the body of Christ. The dumbest thing I've ever heard of that was pronounced on an airplane happened one day when we had a boxer. His name was Cassius Clay. Very good Olympic fighter. Became a professional. Changed his name to Muhammad Ali one day flying on an airplane to an event. And they hit turbulence. The, the passenger dispensed a flight attendant down the rows after an announcement that everyone should buckle their seat belts because of turbulence. The flight attendant approached Muhammad Ali, one of the most famous men in the world. His seat belt was not buckled. <coughs> Mr. Ali, sir, please buckle your seat belt. In that gruff voice that he was known for, he said this, Superman don't need no seat belt. The flight attendant never hesitated. She said, Superman don't need no airplane. Please buckle your seat belt. <laughs> There's no Superman in the body of Christ. We're a bunch of people who needed the desperation of the grace of God. No such thing as Wonder Woman. She's not here. We have a bunch of people who've been saved by amazing grace who have become the workmanship of God in Christ. And we've been called His ambassadors. It's not cool to not follow Him. 